Okay, today we are really focusing in on uh, the essential drugs, the ones that are the backbone of advanced cardiac life support or ACLS. You know, for any provider, doing well isn't just knowing which drug to grab. It's about really nailing the exact doses, the routes, and especially the timing. Exactly right. And our goal here is, well, to give you a kind of concise reference, a quick review of those core ACLS medications. We'll cover the specifics, you know, how they work, when you use them. Uh, And we should probably start right where the pressure is highest, Hmm. the drugs for cardiac arrest. Makes sense. So when the heart stops, the first medication pretty much everyone thinks of is epinephrine. It feels like it's always there in those protocols. It really is. Um, Epinephrine. The standard dose is one milligram. That's one milligram. And you're giving that either intravenously, IV, or intraosseously, IO. And you repeat that same dose every three to five minutes. That stays constant through the whole resuscitation attempt. Right. That three to five minute window is is critical. So what's epinephrine actually doing in the body when we give it for, say, ventricular fibrillation, VF, or pulseless VTAC, a systole, PEA? Well, epinephrine is a powerful sympathomimetic. Uh, its mechanism uses both alpha and beta adrenergic receptors. But in a rest, it's really the alpha effect we're after. It causes this significant peripheral vasoconstriction. Ah, okay. So it's less about jumpstarting the heart directly, and more about redirecting the blood flow from compressions. Precisely. That alpha stimulation constricts those peripheral blood vessels, which increases the systemic vascular resistance. And that action is what boosts the pressure needed to perfuse the coronary arteries in the brain. That helps restore spontaneous circulation. Without that pressure bump, even perfect CPR doesn't get enough oxygen to the heart muscle itself. Got it. Okay, so if epinephrine and maybe a shock or two don't fix refractory VF or pulseless VT, that electrical chaos, we need something to stabilize things chemically. That's amiodarone time. Yes. Amiodarone is specifically for that situation. Refractory V-fib or pulseless V-tach. It comes after you've tried defibrillation and given epinephrine. The first dose is pretty hefty, a 300 milligram bolus, IV or IO. And if that doesn't quite cut it and the rhythm's still, well, life-threatening. Then you can give a follow-up dose of 150 milligrams. Yeah. Um, Amiodarone is what we call a class three antiarrhythmic. Its main job is to prolong the repolarization phase. That's kind of the heart cells reset time. It helps stabilize the cardiac membrane, makes it less prone to firing chaotically. Okay. Now, we also hear about lidocaine sometimes, often as an alternative. When would you choose lidocaine? Why isn't it usually the first choice anymore? Lidocaine's role is for refractory VF or pulseless VT if amiodarone isn't available, or maybe there's a contraindication. The initial dose is weight-based, 1 to 1.5 milligrams per kilogram, IV or IO bolus. And you really have to watch the total amount given, especially if the patient is smaller. Absolutely. You can repeat with smaller doses, uh, 0.5 to 0.75 milligillocalories every 5 to 10 minutes. But critically, you must not go over a total of 3 milligillocalories. Mechanistically, lidocaine is a class 1B antiarrhythmic. So unlike amiodarone, its main action is reducing ventricular automaticity. It sort of dampens down those rogue electrical signals in the ventricles. Amiodarone has that broader effect on repolarization, which is generally why it's preferred first now. Right. Different mechanism. Oh, let's shift gears. Moving away from full arrest to situations where there is a pulse, but the rate or rhythm is the problem. Symptomatic bradycardia. Heart rate dangerously slow. That points to atropine, doesn't it? Yes. First line for symptomatic bradycardia. Atropine is given as one milligram IV. And like epi and arrest, you repeat this dose every three to five minutes. But there's a cap. Ah, the total maximum dose. What is that limit and why is it there? The total maximum is three milligrams. Uh, The reason for the cap is that by three milligrams, you generally achieve full vagal blockade. Giving more atropine is unlikely to increase the heart rate further and just raises the risk of, well, anticholinergic side effects. It works by blocking the vagus nerve's effect on the SA and AV nodes, letting the heart rate naturally speed up. Okay, three milligrams max. Now, if the issue is the opposite, a heart rate that's too fast, specifically supraventricular tachycardia, SVT, and the patient is stable, We switch to adenosine. This one's fascinating. works incredibly fast. Adenosine is all about the technique. It has an extremely short half-life, literally seconds. So use a two-go strategy. First dose is six milligrams, given as a very, very rapid IV push. And you have to immediately follow with a saline flush, maybe 10 or 20 milliliters, and lift the arm up. That flush is almost as important as the drug itself, isn't it? To get it to the heart before it breaks down? Exactly right. If that six milligram doesn't work, the second dose of 12 milligrams, push one or two minutes later, again with that immediate flush. What adenosine does is cause a very brief controlled block at the AV node. It basically 
stops conduction for a few seconds, mm -hmm. hopefully resetting the faulty electrical circuit causing the SVT. Yeah, watching that pause on the monitor, it can feel like a very long few seconds for everyone in the room. It definitely can test your nerves. Yeah. Uh, okay, one more in this rat or rhythm category, magnesium sulfate. This one's more specialized, right? Usually for specific electrolyte issues. Yes. What are the main times you'd use magnesium sulfate in ACLS? The key indications are torsides to point, that specific polymorphic ventricular tachycardia, or if you have arrhythmias clearly linked to low magnesium levels, hypomagnesemia, the dose is one to two grams from IV. And this one isn't a fast push like adenosine, that's important. Very important. Magnesium has to be infused slowly, usually over five to 20 minutes. Pushing it fast can cause significant hypotension. Its job is to stabilize the cardiac cell membranes and suppress certain electrical instabilities called early after depolarizations. Okay, good distinction on the slow infusion. Let's move to some specialized situations. Drugs for specific metabolic problems or toxicities that can really mess up resuscitation efforts. Uh, sodium bicarbonate first. Not used routinely anymore, so the indications are key. Right, sodium bicarb isn't standard in every arrest. The dose is one milliequivalent per kilogram IV. You'd only consider it if you have documented severe metabolic acidosis, known hyperkalemia, high potassium, or maybe an overdose from tricyclic antidepressants, TCAs. That TCA overdose part is interesting. It's doing more than just fixing acidosis there. Correct. While its main job is buffering acid in a TCA overdose, the bicarbonate helps stabilize the myocardial membrane itself. It counteracts how those drugs block sodium channels in the heart muscle. Makes sense. Uh, next, calcium gluconate. Another one for specific electrolyte issues or overdoses. Yes, the standard dose is 10 milliliters of the 10% solution, given IV. And again, like magnesium, this needs to be given slowly. You use it primarily for membrane stabilization when dealing with hyperkalemia or hypocalcemia, low calcium, mm -hmm. or an overdose of calcium channel blockers. And it doesn't actually remove the potassium, does it? It's more about protecting the heart temporarily. Exactly. It helps restore the heart's contractility and shields the cardiac membrane from the dangerous effects of high potassium or the calcium channel blockade. It buys you time while you fix the underlying problem. Okay. So finally, let's say you've successfully resuscitated someone. You've achieved return to spontaneous circulation, ROSC. The pharmacology often shifts then, right? from pushes to drips. Yes, absolutely. If the patient remains hypotensive after getting a pulse back or if they're in cardiogenic shock, we often move to continuous infusions. Epinephrine infusion is a common choice. Typical dose range is around 0.1 to 0.5 micrograms per kilogram per min. And dopamine is still an option there too for post-ROSC support. It is. Dopamine infusions are used to maintain blood pressure and perfusion after arrest. They need constant adjustment, titration, based on how the patient is responding clinically. Yeah, that post-arrest care really shows how these drugs work together with everything else. They're supportive players, enabling the compressions and shocks to work. That's really the core message, isn't it? You can know every dose perfectly, but these ACLS drugs are support systems. They don't replace high-quality CPR and getting the defibrillator on quickly, those actions. Yeah. CPR and early defibrillation, they remain the absolute foundation for any chance of a good outcome. That link between the hands-on care and the drugs is so vital. We've spent this time focusing on getting these drugs exactly right down to the milligram or microgram.